Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about filter offsets. Ever since I started this channel, I have received a lot of questions which tend to indicate that a lot of beginner or even intermediate astrophotographers don't quite understand what filter offsets are or how to use them in their astrophotography. Even just recently, I saw a video on a popular YouTube channel where the author was running autofocus with a narrowband filter, which tells me that this topic is more misunderstood than I had originally thought. I consider filter offsets absolutely essential. So in this video, I am going to explain what they are in a way that hopefully everyone can understand. And I'll share a few tips and tricks that I've learned in the last few years so that you too can apply filter offsets to your own equipment and get better results. All right, let's get started. Let's consider a parallel beam of monochromatic light focused by the objective lens or mirror of a telescope. The light rays converge onto the sensor of our camera, which has to be precisely placed at the focal plane of the optical system in order to create an image with the highest level of sharpness. Now let's see what happens to the light rays when a filter is inserted along the light path. When the light hits the filter, which is basically a piece of glass, it is ever so slightly refracted when it enters and when it exits the filter. The consequence of this double refraction is that the focal plane has now moved by a small distance, and that distance is what we call the filter offset. With a monochromatic beam of light, the offset depends on the focal ratio of the telescope, the thickness of the filter, and the refractive index of the filter substrate at that wavelength. As you can imagine, once a filter has been inserted in the light path, the image formed by the objective lens or mirror onto the sensor is no longer as sharp as it could possibly be. The solution to this problem is simply to refocus the imaging train. If all your filters came from a set, they may have been advertised by the manufacturer as being parfocal. For example, I purchased my RGB filters from Agena Astro. It's a set manufactured by Antlia called V-Series LRGB Pro and I'll put an affiliate link to this product in the description and the comment section of this video. The product page on the Agena Astro website clearly states that the filters within the set are parfocal, and I have no reason to doubt this statement. However, when I use these filters with my refractor, I can see that they all incur a different offset. So what is going on here? Let's take a look. My refractor is an AstroTech AT130 EDT, and it has a triplet objective lens that makes use of ED glass. In spite of that, and being a budget refractor, it has some amount of residual longitudinal chromatic aberration, which I was able to demonstrate using my spectrograph in its low resolution configuration. Here you can see the 2D spectrum of a star across the entire visible spectrum, and it shows a fairly typical fishtail effect in the deep blue part of the spectrum, starting at 420 nanometers. All refractors are subject to this issue to some extent, even the most expensive ones, although the very best refractors have that fishtail start in the near UV part of the spectrum. Whereas in the case of my refractor, it starts in the visible region of the spectrum. Now let's see what happens when we switch between various parfocal color filters using a budget refractor. As you can see, the fact that each color has a different focal plane to begin with will cause even parfocal filters to incur an offset. And again, to compensate for that offset and obtain the highest level of sharpness, all you need to do is refocus the imaging train upon switching filters. Okay, so now that we know what filter offsets are, what do we do with them? I mentioned earlier that you need to refocus the imaging train upon inserting a filter or when switching between filters. Running an autofocus routine at that point is certainly possible, but it can take a good chunk of time, especially if you're switching to a narrowband filter, which will require a much longer exposure in order to show enough stars for the autofocus algorithm to work properly. So a better approach is to measure the offset for each filter compared to a reference filter, which is usually a broadband filter, like a UVIR cut filter, and to tell the software to move the focuser according to that offset every time you change filters. So let me show you how to do all this. 
The first step is to measure your filter offsets. Measuring filter offsets is something that you need to do only once per telescope and per set of filters. I have only one telescope and one set of filters, so uh, this is something that I had to do only once. And because you need to do it only once, it's a good idea to take the time and do it well. So here's how I do it. I will assume that you use Nina and that you've already configured your filters in the Nina settings tab under equipment. Make sure that you do not have a filter marked as the autofocus filter. This is critical. I will also assume that you understand what focuser backlash is and that you've properly configured focuser backlash compensation in Nina. Next, I like to point my telescope to an area of the sky where I can find a good number of relatively bright stars. An open cluster is perfect for that. Then in Nina, I manually run an autofocus routine for each filter, and I do that sequence five times in a row. So if you have seven filters in your filter wheel, that's a total of 35 autofocus runs. Depending on the filter, you will need to adjust the autofocus exposure time. For example, I use a three second exposure with my luminance filter, but I bump that up to 30 second exposure uh, with my narrowband filters. I also enable PEC, periodic air correction, on my mount to limit the amount of periodic air during those longer exposures because I cannot guide while running autofocus. That's the downside of using an OAG, and we'll talk more about this later. Every time an autofocus run has completed, I keep track of the focus position before moving on to the next filter, and I enter those values into a Google spreadsheet. I also find it useful to plot the focus values for each filter as a line graph. Usually you will see lines that are nearly horizontal, but sometimes those lines may have a slope, as in my case, and that is caused by the temperature change during the session. The reason I like to graph the data is because it allows me to visually spot outliers, which I can then eliminate to gain better accuracy. Finally, to calculate the offset between your reference filter and another filter, you simply subtract their respective focus values during each autofocus run, and you compute the average of those offsets. This is something that can easily be done using a formula in Google Spreadsheets or Excel. As you can see, it's pretty easy, and it only takes a couple of hours. But if this sounds like a lot of work to you, you can also use the Filter Offset Calculator Nina plugin, formerly known as Darks Customs. I have never used it, but Patriot Astro did a video on it a while back, so I will put a link to it right here. Okay, so now that we have our offsets, what do we do with them? Let's go back to the Nina settings, and let's enter the offset you calculated for each filter. Keep in mind that offsets can be negative. Enter zero for your reference filter and mark it as the autofocus filter. With this setup, whenever Nina needs to run an autofocus routine, it will first switch to your selected autofocus filter, run the autofocus routine, and then automatically switch back to the filter you had prior to that. And while doing so, it will order the focuser to move by the offset you configured in the Nina settings for that filter. And if you switch between filters, Nina will automatically apply the necessary offset between the filter you're switching from and the filter you're switching to, so that you don't need to run another autofocus routine. If you couple filter offsets with focuser temperature compensation, you can reduce the number of autofocus runs in a night of imaging to the strict minimum, no matter how complex your imaging sequence might be. If you're curious about focuser temperature compensation, I created a video about it, and I'll put a link to it right here. There is one last topic I wanted to cover today, and that is what happens with filter offsets when you use an off-axis guider, or OAG for short. Let's tackle that next. I switched from a guide scope to an off-axis guider a couple of years ago because I had some differential flexure in my system, which led to elongated stars, and here is how I was able to prove it. I captured a number of images of the same field of view, guiding with a guide scope, and with dithering disabled. And in PixInsight, I opened all of those images in the Blink tool, and as you can see, the stars drift in the field of view. Switching to an OAG immediately fixed this once and for all. 
Quill the Lazy Geek recently posted a video about using an off-axis guider on his Newtonian telescope with great success. I'll also put a link to his video right here in case you missed it. So I am a big fan of off-axis guiders, but filter offsets can cause some issues with them. So let's take a look. In this diagram, you can see what an imaging train with an OEG looks like. Now let's insert a filter in front of the sensor, but behind the OEG pick-off prism. You never place the OEG behind the filter for two reasons. First, if you were to place the OEG behind the filter, your GAD exposures might need to be very long, especially if you use a narrowband filter, and that would be even worse if your telescope has a high focal ratio. As a result of those longer exposures, your guiding accuracy will be lower. That is also why I do not believe in ZWO's latest camera offering, like the ASI 2600MC Duo. Second, your filter being slightly further away from the sensor may cause some additional vignetting. So remember to always place the OEG before the filter as shown in this diagram. Okay, now let's compensate for the filter offset by moving the imaging train focuser. Now the imaging sensor will be able to capture a sharp image. However, the guide camera is no longer in focus and this could be a problem. Here is what my guide camera sees when I switch from a luminance filter to a red filter. No matter how good phd 2s star detection algorithm is, it will detect fewer stars, if any, and the centroid of the detected stars will not be as precise as if you had a sharp image. Thankfully, there is a solution, and it comes in the form of this little device. This is a fun little DIY project I've already talked about on this channel. You can find the GitHub page for this project at this URL. This device, which is designed to work with ZW's helical focuser, allows you to automatically and remotely refocus your OEG guide camera. And the software that I wrote can automatically do this upon changing filters, so that you always have perfectly sharp stars in your guide camera. Take a look at the result. One last thing, filter offsets are useful whether you use a monochrome camera, an OSC camera, or a DSLR. And they are valuable even if you do not own an electronic filter wheel. For example, you could have a filter drawer and still be able to reap the benefits of having your filter offsets properly configured. Nina has a device called manual filter wheel for this use case. All right, that's all I have for you today. I hope that you found this explanation of filter offsets useful. As you can see, they're not that mysterious, but having a good grasp of what they are and how to use them can really improve your imaging results. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop me a line in the comment section below. I am already working on my next video uh, in which I will review a brand new high-end refractor that recently came out. If you don't want to miss it, make sure to subscribe to the channel. So until next time, thank you for watching.